Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jim Glover, and I'm one of the senior associate deans at the School of Social Work here at Columbia. We are gathered today to discuss coming to campus for hybrid coursework at the school. But before I get started I, and I introduce the panelists, I want to take just a moment and acknowledge current events and all that is happening around us. Describing COVID as challenging does not begin to capture its devastating scope and impact, but it has also been heartening to see so many adapt to remote learning, virtual work, and new ways of engagement within our field and beyond. We've all faced so much over the past six months. COVID, the economic and social damage of the lockdown, anti-Asian discrimination, and specifically anti-Chinese discrimination, the virus's disproportionate impact on communities of color, and the rampant anti-Black racism that has prompted significant protests across the country and around the world. Given these profound challenges, it is clear that social work must be at the center in addressing the crises of this moment, and there are many. Welcome and welcome back to the ongoing journey, and thank you. Now to introductions in today's program. In addition to participants that include students, faculty, and staff, our panelists include Dr. Melanie Bernitz, Associate Vice President and Medical Director and Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine, who will discuss public health, COVID-19 testing, and the compact. Jerry McGillian, Vice President of Operations, who will talk about university-wide campus facilities initiatives. Gerard Bueno, Senior Associate Dean for Administration, Finance, and Planning, who will join me in discussing CSSW-specific updates and procedures. And then finally, but not least, Moira Curtin, Assistant Dean of Advising and Lecture in Social Work, and Michael Lavaglio, Associate Dean for Enrollment and Student Services, will discuss virtual support and a bit about everything you learned last week in orientation. We'll conclude with a question and answer period. And now over to Dr. Melanie Burnitz. Dr. Burnitz? Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon um, to you all. It's my pleasure to be here with you and share some information on some of the public health pieces. Um, and testing and, and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, so I, I like to start by sharing, um, just looking a little bit of what's happening in the US picture. And this is a slide you've probably seen, which really shows how the virus, the number of virus cases picked up across the United States in April, reached what we thought was a peak of around 30,000 cases per day, started to decline, but then back in late June and going on through July and August, we saw a significant increase, peaking at about 70,000 cases per day. This was, you know, people talk about waves. This was still the, the, the second peak of the first wave. And what we're seeing now is the decline in that um, peak. We, we seem to be stabilizing, but maybe around 40,000 cases a day. So there's still a lot of cases per day of COVID-19 in the United States. But contrast that with what's happening in New York City. And this is somewhat of a good news story because the New York City data really shows that we had that rapid increase um, in early April, um, peaking at about um, 5,000 cases per day and then a significant decline. And where we are down to now with just you know, around four or 500 cases per day, that um, sustained low level has gone on for um, six, eight weeks now. And that what that really is telling us is that the pattern in New York City, what we're all coming back to campus to, is a far um, better environment than what we're seeing across the country. So, so how does that feed into coming back to ca campus and being in this remote and this hybrid environment? Well, the first is thinking about our community health compact. This is the compact you should have all read, you should have all signed, um, which really talks about our um, responsibility as a community to each other. It talks about all the things we as individuals will do to keep each other safe. And it also talks about what the university will do to keep us safe. So it's a real community ethos. I think it probably speaks very strongly to you all as social work students or faculty or staff, because of that way we all intersect with each other and keep each other safe. Um, so really make sure you've read it in detail, that you abide by it, that you understand it. And there's also a comprehensive program to support adherence through the Office of University Life. There are avenues through which you can non-compliance with this um, and so we really are all working together as a community to keep each other safe. 
Um, the other thing you, you'll have heard a lot about is the daily symptom check. This is the Reopen CU app. Make sure you have that downloaded on your phone. Everyone is required to complete that every day that you come onto campus. It's three simple questions about whether or not you have symptoms of COVID-19, if you've tested positive in the last 14 days, or if you've been in contact with someone who is positive or you are one, come from one of the restricted states or international destinations. If, you, if your answer is a no to all those questions, you'll get a green pass. If you answer yes to any one of those questions, you get a red pass. This is linked to your Linnell Swipe access. So it really allows access to campus. Obviously, if you get a red pass, stay home follow guidance, but if you get a green pass, that is linked to your access to campus. Additionally, linked to access to campus are compliance with the testing program that I'll talk about in a moment, as well as signing the attestation and taking your online training. And the other thing, hopefully, if you've been through our testing center, you'll have gotten your mask. If you are coming for testing, you'll get your mask. We're providing every member of, uh, of the community with two Columbia branded face coverings. Um, this is because face coverings have been shown to be one of those really impactful public health interventions that do reduce transmission of the virus. They really work. So we're really spending a lot of effort in making sure our community is compliant with face coverings. As a Columbia community member, you are expected to wear a face covering at all times on campus. And the only exception is if you're in a private room or office with the door closed or if you're eating, because obviously you can't eat with a mask on. But if you are eating with others, make sure you're six feet apart and you're maintaining that physical distancing. You can wear any face covering you choose, so long as it covers your nose and your mouth and is a good fit. You're not obliged to wear the Columbia face covering, but people are wearing them because they're really high quality, they're comfortable. But if you prefer the, the disposable surgical face mask, that's fine too. Um, as I say, good fit, covers the nose and the mouth, and just make sure you wash them. These you can wash by hand in warm soapy water, hang them up to dry, they dry overnight. That's why we've given you two. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about testing because this is usually where a lot of the questions um, come up. And if you've been on any of the previous webinars, you'll have heard me speak about the approach we've taken to testing, how we've really um, looked at some modeling approaches, we've used some epidemiological analysis and public health principles really to define the best approach. And then it's a very fluid, flexible approach because we want to be able to adapt to what's happening in New York City or in the country. And as I showed you that early slide with a baseline in New York City as it is now, that's really affected what we believe is the right um, testing strategy currently, but we are nimble and we're ready to adapt it as we need to. So there are two main components to the testing program. The first is initial testing, and the second is ongoing testing. Um, and I just want to clarify that these use PCR tests, which are diagnostic tests, which look to establish the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We're not talking about antibody testing, which looks at uh, evidence that the body's immune system has responded to a previous infection. That's because we don't know right now if an antibody test gives long-term protection. So we're not using those currently as a component of our testing program. This is about diagnostic PCR testing. Um, the first step is gateway testing for every Columbia affiliate. This allows us to check the baseline at entry. And every member of our community who's returned since June 22nd has gone through gateway testing. Um, as of today, we have exceeded over 14,500 gateway tests. The data is published on the dashboard on covid19.columbia.edu, so you can see our total number of tests, our total number of positives. Since we initiated our gateway testing program, we've had a total of 10 positive tests with over 13,000 tests completed. So all of you are required to get your gateway test, and I'll explain how you do that. We then also have ongoing surveillance tests. Um, and for the majority, which includes you as students, faculty and staff at the School of Social Work, we're taking a, a random sampling approach. And this allows us on a weekly um, basis to test a, a sample of the population to really evaluate what's happening with our prevalence. The size of that sample and in fact the frequency can change as we see changes on campus. Currently we're sampling 5% a week but as I say we can increase that sample size as we need to. Um, so you may get invited after your gateway test to have a, a random sampling test and you may get invited for that multiple times and we do ask that you comply with that. Um, for our students living in dorms, they're having um, a slightly different um, testing program because of the impact of congregate, um, congregate living. Um, 
The testing center that I will describe is only if you have no symptoms. If you do have symptoms, it is important you get evaluated. As students, you should have access to Columbia Health. If you're feeling symptomatic, please go to our website, health.columbia.edu. It'll let you know how to get a hold of us. We can do telehealth appointments, evaluate, and if you do need testing, we'll do that in John Jay Hall in our medical service not at the testing sites um, that I'm about to describe, but we do have access to rapid testing on site should you have symptoms. So what do you have to do? First of all, go to covid19.columbia.edu under um, public health and testing for all the details. It's important to know you cannot walk in for your gateway or surveillance testing. It is appointment only. Obviously, we want to make sure everyone's safe and physically distanced. So you do this through the online patient portal, the same portal that you schedule any appointment with Columbia Health. You sign in with your union password. You select appointments. Make sure you select the Morningside site if you live here. If you live up by CUIMC, you can certainly go to that site. Select the appointment day and time, and you'll be given a QR code. Um, that's a touchless way for you to check in when you come to your testing appointment. If you have any issues scheduling, please email us at covidtesttrace at columbia.edu. As they say, if you are invited um, after your gateway test as part of the random sample, you'll get um, an invite the week prior, and you'll be given a five-day window to complete that test. So what happens at the testing site? Make sure you complete your symptom self-attestation before you come. Um, obviously, if you're not feeling well, don't come. Seek out medical attention. Make sure you wear face covering. Bring your ID if you have it. Um, and arrive at the time of your appointment and follow the directional signage and the staff instructions. We'll scan your QR code. That checks you in. You're given a label um, for your specimen, and you go to a testing booth. In the testing booth, we ask you to blow your nose. Um, you apply the label to the specimen tube. Use hand sanitizer, and then we give you basically a little Q-tip, and you swab the inside of your nose, the lower part of your nose. This is not the deep nasal swab. You swab it yourself. You're observed doing it, and you swab three times in one nostril, three times in the other. You pop it um, downwards into the specimen tube. You put, use some hand sanitizer, and you leave. And um, the entire process from entry to exit from the building should take less than 10 minutes. You will receive either an email or a phone call when your results are available. And if it is a positive test, you'll be contacted by telephone and given guidance for isolation and care and follow up. And when you do get the email with your results, it, it provides you instructions on how to access your results. The email comes from Careval, which is our partner. It doesn't come from Columbia, so a lot of people put these in spam. Um, and usually it's coming out around 48 hours after your test. Again, if you don't get that result after you check your spam or your regular inbox, certainly email us and we will assist. Um, I just want to spend a moment talking about contact tracing. Obviously, this is an important strategy to control the COVID-19 pandemic. And this allows us to um, identify anyone who's been in contact with someone who is infectious um, during that time and ask them to self-quarantine for 14 days um, so that they can then protect themselves. Usually, this is something that happens through New York City Department of Health, but we have actually set up our own internal contact tracing program so that we can be much speedier in the evaluation of any contacts. Um, so, so if you do, if someone does test positive, you will receive a call from the Columbia Contact Tracing Program to interview you and find out who you were in contact with during the infectious period. We do everything to protect all your information confidentially and sensitively um, so as not to disclose your identity, um, and, but, but to protect anyone you may have been in contact with. So certainly, if you do get a call from our contact tracing team, we ask you to participate um, with them. Um, a close contact is defined as someone you've had contact with for two days prior to the onset of your symptoms or two days prior to testing if you had no symptoms. And it's someone who you were within six feet of for more than 10 minutes. As I mentioned, we will do the Columbia contact tracing, um, and then you will get contacted by the New York City team um, for your outside of Columbia, your household and other contacts. Um, as I mentioned, this is a collaboration between Columbia Health and the Mailman School of Com uh, Public Health. We've got contact tracing supervisors, a team of contact tracers. They've received extensive training, not only the standard training received um, by the city contact tracers, but some very Columbia-specific protocols as well. And we do liaise with the New York City Test and Trace Corps. 
Just really quickly, I wanted to mention quarantine. There were two scenarios where you were asked to quarantine. The first is obvious, and, and quarantining is for healthy people, separating healthy people who've been exposed to a disease but don't yet have symptoms. And the two scenarios are the precautionary travel quarantine for anyone coming from one of the hotspot states on the um, New York State Travel Advisory List um, or one of the international level two or level three countries by the CDC list. Um, that's a 14-day quarantine. And then obviously anyone who's identified as being a close contact of someone who tests positive will also be asked to quarantine for 10 day, uh, for 14 days. That is um, in contrast to isolation, which is if someone tests positive or is sick. Um, and those individuals either waiting for their results or who have a positive result will be asked to isolate separately. Usually um, isolation is a minimum of 10 days. It can be longer depending on how long symptoms last. And we will give you direction when you can end your isolation period. So in summary, um, schedule your appointment for your gateway testing if you haven't done it. Make sure on the day of your appointment you um, fill in the attestation. Um, and if this is your first test, just the gateway test, this must be done before you access campus. So we ask you to quarantine while you await your results. You cannot access campus while you're awaiting those results. Um, obviously, if you test positive, you'll be asked to isolate. If you're negative and you're not, and you are from one of the um, countries or states on the advisory, you will have to quarantine even if your result is negative. You cannot test out of the quarantine requirement. So that's a really important point. Even if your test is negative and you have to quarantine, you still quarantine. But if you test negative and you're not from one of the hotspot states, um, when the test result is back, you are able to access campus. Um, I also just want to remind you that you do have access to Columbia Health and all the resources we have available. Um, please, please check out the website health.columbia.edu um, around how to access medical services, both in-person and telehealth, counseling and psychological services who have tremendous resources. If you are quarantining right now, we have daily virtual support groups. So you can really go and drop in on any one of those. But there, I believe, are about 31 other support groups during the fall semester for a whole range of other conditions um, or concerns. Also access to Alice Health Promotion, Disability Services and Sexual Violence Response. So in summary, campus will look very different, um, but we uh, we feel very ready for the reactivation of campus. And if we, we, if we all follow the guidance, we can stay safe and support each other. So we very much look forward to seeing you back on campus. And with that, I will turn over to Jerry McGilliam. Hello, everybody. Um, Thank you, Melanie. So I just wanted to take the time here a few minutes to let everybody know about the initiatives we're doing to uh, make sure that the buildings are as safe as possible for everybody using them. Um, so what facilities has done, you know, broadly is kind of falls into three different categories. Uh, one is signage, one is uh, ventilation, which involves the airflow, and the other is um, cleaning, cleanliness. So these are the three major initiatives that we looked at. Uh, as you'll go through the buildings, you'll, you'll see signage all throughout the building. Um, I think some of the key signs will, will, that are out there will involve the capacity for elevators, how many people should be in an elevator, capacity for restrooms, how many people should be in the restrooms, uh, maximum capacity in classrooms. Uh, you should see traffic flow signs, uh, of course, signs about reminding everybody of social distancing and masks. Um, so those are the, the kind of key signs that you'll see out there. Uh, and they should be, you know, pretty, they're, they're all throughout the buildings. Um, so that's cover signage. The ventilation, what we looked at, we took a couple last steps as far as ventilation. And ventilation is, by ventilation, I mean airflow into the building and the spaces, which is, is critical to uh, making sure the buildings are as safe as possible. So the first thing we started in every building, we created a fact sheet. And a fact sheet talks about the um, HVAC system in general with all the key information so somebody can look at the fact sheet and see exactly what equipment is in the building and what needs to be um, working. So from there, we then looked at filtration. So filtration was, was uh, a very important. And in many of the, in a lot of what we've done here, these protocols we developed, we searched out guidelines from, from, you know, the agencies who were involved in this, such as the New York State, CDC, some important uh, organizations such as ASFRAE, and looked at their recommendations and made sure we were in compliance with them. So one of the key uh, requirements for filtration is the recommendation is that it be a MERV 13 or higher filter. 
which is a rating on the effectiveness of the filter. So we went through all our, our air handling units. We looked at the filtration, made sure we had MERV 13. If we didn't, um, we then upgraded it to MERV 13. And I would say in almost all the cases, we've been able to upgrade to at least MERV 13 filtration. So then we wanted to make sure that all the ventilation equipment was working because that, that's also key, right? Because it, there's a lot of, of uh, equipment involved in, in ventilation. So we went through and we identified and made sure all the equipment was working and where it wasn't, we, we fixed it obviously and verified that it, it, it is working. Um, from there, then we've gone through all the spaces and, and verified that we have airflow into the spaces. Um, and so that's, those are the, the key steps we took as, as far as ventilation goes. Um, and obviously we will continue to monitor that going forward as this is, is critical. Um, so those are the, the ventilation and the other thing we did, uh, involved cleanliness. So obviously we wanted to increase the level of cleanliness. We, um, upgraded all our cleanliness protocols. Um, so for example, you know, we're, Twice a day, we're going to clean the classrooms. Um, twice a day, we're going to clean the bathrooms. Um, we're going to spend more time policing. Um, we've added more hand sanitizer stations to all the buildings. Um, we installed flushometers and, and faucet, touchless flushometers and faucets in, in all the bathrooms and all the common bathrooms. And so these, you know, as well as, as uh, you know, anything else we're doing to, you know, basically improve the level of cleanliness of the buildings. Um, we also went through and, and checked all the plumbing systems to make sure that, that you know, because the buildings have been sitting for a while, to, to flush them all out, make sure all the water was running right. Um, so those are the, the key areas that we worked on to make sure that the buildings are, are you know, safe and ready to use. And obviously, this is something that will be continuing on a daily basis. Uh, facility staff will be out there daily making sure the HVAC equipment is working as well as the uh, buildings are clean. So that is a um, key focus for us going forward. And just want to know that we will be continuing to, to work on this as we go forward in the future. So those are the main areas for the, the building uh, cleanliness or for making sure the buildings are safe. Um, so from there, I'd like to turn this over to Gerard and Jim. So. Thank you, Jerry. Um, good afternoon, all. I um, just wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, going over what we've done here at the School of Social Work. Um, following on um, Jerry McGillan's and his team's work on all Columbia facilities, um, we've also been uh, making various school-specific changes uh, to our space and operations in accordance with university guidelines, uh, building occupancy at the School of Social Work has been reduced uh, quite significantly. We expect occupancy in the building during the fall term to be well within the uh, maximum density per university guidelines. We, with, uh, in classrooms, the number of seats will be less than 50% of normal seating capacity. We will also be setting up classrooms to ensure that physical distancing can be maintained. And um, since most faculty and researchers and staff um, will continue to work remotely uh, through most of the fall, only a limited number of employees will be in the building. Those who must be uh, in the building will be on staggered, staggered schedules to minimize density. Spaces throughout the building have been modified uh, to promote physical distancing and reduce um, high-touch surfaces. This includes the removal of furniture and equipment where possible and signage in spaces that should not be used in order to maintain physical distancing and reduce shared equipment. Other modifications uh, in the building are the reduced occupancy for elevators and restrooms. Elevator occupancy is limited uh, to two people at a time. So if you're able to, uh, you can use the stairs to get to and from the classrooms on the third floor. We would just ask that you maintain as much physical distance as possible when using the stairs. 
uh, restrooms will have signage to indicate the maximum occupancy uh, for each room. And where necessary, stalls in some restrooms have been closed off to maintain the required capacity. Finally, we have placed markers on the floors to direct the flow of traffic in, in the hallways. I uh, would just like to conclude by saying that uh, we very much look forward to welcome all of you back on campus starting next week and are uh, committed to doing what we can to help ensure your safety. The uh, building's entrance will be open for students during and around class hours uh, on the days that we have in-person classes. Uh, just make sure when entering the social work building, please remember to have your ID and uh, to be prepared to present your green pass to indicate that you've completed the symptom self-check at the station. Uh, thank you, and all over to Jim. Hi again, everyone. I'm just going to add a little bit to what Gerard just mentioned, uh, a little bit more information about the hybrid courses. So for MSW students, information about your in-person and your Zoom rotation is actually located in your Canvas site. The answer is easy for this week because all of the classes are in Zoom. So the first time potentially that any MSW course would be in person would be next week. But again, your exact rotation is located on the homepage of your Canvas site. Um, when you come in, you will additionally see a couple of staff members that will greet you. There'll be an ability occasionally to meet briefly for 15 or 20 minutes with student services and advising office uh, representatives, um, including myself. Um, and the location of the courses specifically is the third floor. So one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, you're headed to the third floor for coursework. Uh, right now, 311 and 312 is the main location. If that shifts to another room on the third floor, we would, we would let you know. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Moira Curtin and Michael Lavaglio. Hello, everybody. My name is Moira Curtin, and I'm the Assistant Dean and Director for the Office of Advising. I also welcome each and every one of you to Columbia School of Social Work. You're going to have an awesome experience. It's going to be great, and you're going to be feeling really prepared to be a social worker and work. As Jim said, the world needs us, and here you are. So as you heard in orientation last week, and I want to emphasize that all of the departments who are student-facing are ready and able and wanting to support you. We are all available to answer any questions you have, and we are we can meet you either through Zoom or on the phone. And for those of us who are who are going to be there, and I'm one of them, can certainly meet you in person. And the departments I'm referring to include the Office of Advising, my office, um, uh, Student Services, Career Development, Career Leadership and Development, Field Education, the Admissions Office, and the Writing Center. So if there are any questions or any, any, anything you need to know at all, and even if you think that, oh, they went over that in orientation, I'm, I should know it. Please, a lot of information has been given to you, and we absolutely understand that questions will come up. So now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael Lovaglio, and um, he'll respond also. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. I also uh, want to welcome you all to Columbia and back to campus. Um, as Moira indicated, uh, please, if there's a couple of things we should remember from orientation, one main thing, uh, you all belong. And the entire student-facing team, as Moira indicated, uh, are here uh, to be available to you. Um, our teams in uh, career and leadership development are planning programming. They are available for one-on-one -on -one counseling. The financial aid team similarly is uh, available to you. Uh, throughout the time of uh, you're here, student services, uh, student affairs, all of our teams will be available to you as they mentioned during orientation. And finally, also the admissions uh, team. There might be a few last minute uh, admissions details. Um, uh, that team also uh, are available to you. Myself, I will be joining Moira and Jim. Uh, to be on campus, so I hope and look forward to looking uh, meeting you. And uh, and again, please uh, do not uh, hesitate to reach out. We are here. These are challenging times, but exciting times, and uh, we really look forward uh, to 
partnering with you to make this a successful uh, fall term. Thank you. I'll pass back to Jim. Thank you, Moira. Thank you, Michael. Now to our question and answer period. So I'm going to ask Melanie a few questions. Uh, some of these are related. Um, first, how often do we have to get tested for COVID on campus? Um, and related, how frequently can we get tested on our own at Columbia? Great questions. Thank you. So the requirement is, is the initial gateway testing. Everybody has to have that test. After that, there is no um, kind of regular requirement that we have. As I say, we are sampling our population every week currently. Obviously, we could change that. But right now, that's what we're doing. So you only can get tested if you receive an email invitation for a follow-up test after that initial gateway test that everyone must do. So some people may get multiple of those through the semester and some people may not get any or may only get one or two. So that is the requirement. Unfortunately, we cannot offer voluntary testing. So someone might say, well, I just want to get tested once a week. Can I come in? And unfortunately, we cannot do that right now. However, there are plenty of city resources where you can do that. So go to the New York City site. If I, I'll actually find it and pop it in the chat when I'm not being asked a question. Um, but there are many sites, including in this neighborhood here, where if you do want to go for an additional test, you can go. And then the last piece is I mentioned before, if you do have symptoms, please reach out to Columbia Health so we can do an evaluation. And then obviously, if you need testing, we'll test you. But we'll do that in the John Jay Hall Clinic, not at the um, testing centers. Thank you. And uh, apologize for me asking a similar question in a different way. But um, I'm a student who meets every other week in person. Do I need to get tested each time that I come in for my in-person week in my hybrid format? No, just the initial gateway testing, as I say, but you will be included in that sample even if you're coming in every other week. Slightly different question. Um, tell me about flu shots and when, when those are happening. Oh, my favorite question. Thank you for asking. In fact, you will all be getting notification this week. We are starting to offer flu shots next week, starting on September the 14th. This year is different. Normally, we encourage everyone to get flu shots. This year, anyone who is access, any student who is accessing campus is required to get a flu shot because of its the, the significant importance. Um, so any student is required. Obviously, if you have a me medical exemption, that you can go through the exemption process. Uh, but hopefully, you'll all get your flu shot and understand how important it is this year to, to, um, to protect against flu because of the additional burden that's going to add to our healthcare system um, this year. We'll be giving them starting next week, and actually, they will be available by appointment in the same site as the testing center. So you, those of you who've been there previously know we do massive flu fairs, three days, come and get them. Flu vaccines will be available Monday through Friday, um, all day by appointment at the testing center. So it'll be really easy for you to get your flu shot this year, starting next week. Um, and and you, you, you should get it by October 30th. Great, thank you. Um, this might be a question for Jerry, maybe for Melanie. I, I'm interested in getting additional Columbia masks. Is that possible? Unfortunately not. We, these are hot items and we only have the availability to give one set to every member of our community who is accessing campus. So, so take really good care of them um, because we can't give extras. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, jumping topics to IDs. Michael, could you answer when IDs would be available for students? Sure. Thank you, Jim. A number of IDs, largely for students who identified uh, that will be in New York, um, have been processed, and we do have those, and the Office of Student Services will be communicating with students um, to um, schedule times that are convenient to distribute those. The university is still uh, working at contingency plans for students who are uh, remote uh, to receive their IDs. If you have any questions about your IDs, uh, please feel free to contact us at Student Services. Thank you. I'll just add that there's been a couple of other questions about how do we access the building? Do we need the ID? There's information about the compact and the green, um, the green light that comes on our app. The answer is both your ID to get on the space as well as the green affirmation of the compact. Okay, um, looking through some other prior questions. Um, which rooms, the third floor? Uh, stairs and elevator are possible for access to the, to the third floor. Um, and I think those are all our questions. Okay, everyone. Again, as I said at the beginning, a very warm welcome. 
And thank you so much. And uh, this will be recorded. And if other questions come up, we'll, we'll post them along with this, with this event. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.